It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Marge Ferrigian, DDS, FAGD. He's the Director of Continuing Education, Recruitment, and Advanced Training, and a past transition Colton for Paragon Dental Practice Transitions. He graduated from Columbia University College of Dental Medicine in 79, practiced in the United States Air Force pursuant to receiving the Health Profession Scholarship, thank you for serving, as an associate for two years and in private practice for 25 years. He's tra- um, he's transitioned uh, practices since 2009. Um, he transitioned his own practice in 2009 and stayed on to work for the buyer there for another two years. During that period, he transitioned dozens of practices from which he accumulated a treasure trove of experiences. He's an assistant clinical professor of dental medicine at Columbia University School of Dental Medicine since 95, has served as faculty in the Department of Behavioral Science. He's a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry and a member of the ADA. He is a general dentist and was in private practice in Montville, New Jersey prior to his retirement. Paragon provides expert consultation to dentists regarding transitions to the practice, such as practice valuations, practice sales, mergers, acquisitions, consolidations, pre-retirement sales, equity buy-in associates, co-ownerships, relocations, and other transition aspects. Paragon has a track record of integrity and expertise through thousands of successful transitions since 1998 all across the U.S. Um, my gosh, um, uh, this is just amazing. Um, I don't do commercials. Um, he didn't ask me to come on the show. I asked him. And the reason I asked him, the big question I have for him is very simple. We've had Dental Town since 1999. The classified ads is one of the biggest sections. For 20 years, there was always a thousand dental offices for sale and 4,000 jobs for my young associates. Now there's 2,000 practices for sale and there's only 1,000 jobs. This pandemic made everyone as old as me and you say, you know what, I've had enough of this crap. I'm selling my practice. And then the young kids are like, well, what do I do? I, I, I don't have a job. No one's, no one's um, trying to hire me. And, no, and they're like, well, can you buy a dental practice in the middle of a, of a pandemic? So we're old and our job is to help our replacements. A quarter of our listeners are still in dental kindergarten school. And so I hope to aim this. We'll, we'll talk about the older sellers later, but I want to I want to help the young kids. You know, they've been out of school five years or less. Can you buy a damn dental office in the middle of a pandemic? Is that even a good idea? Uh, believe it, we were asked that question often. And the reality is it's as good as time as any. You know, it, it really, really doesn't matter. Uh, you, you know, we're in this mindset. We think that because there was a pandemic, everything uh, just slowed down and practices deteriorated. But there, there's a big difference between all practices in the country shutting down because of the pandemic versus, let's say, a practice that shuts down for uh, disability reasons or whatever else, or maybe locally the economy went downhill because one big company went out of business, you know, and they had all insurance. So the reality is that the potential of these practices are still the same. They're not, the patients didn't go away. The patients did not go to another practice uh, because theirs was shut down. Everybody stayed home. So what we are finding is that uh, with all the the clients that we deal with and we have already, you know, listings and we keep up with them constantly, especially now we want to know what's happening. They're either matching what they were doing the year before month over month, or some of them actually are increasing because, you know, there's a lot of pent up demand. So in a roundabout way, you know, to your answer, yeah, I'm saying it's a great time to buy a practice uh, because when you go in, just the pent up demand might be good for you to go ahead and, and, and just pick up where that practitioner left off. Well, my gosh, and you should know, cause you graduated in the same year I did in 1987. So we've all seen this movie three or four times. I mean, you know, we all know um, we've been around the block on this several times, but specifically I'm, I want to hold your feet to the fire. What would you tell a new graduate? Um, we, um, 
I can't believe the the one year anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring a pandemic is next week. I mean, this is March second. But what would you um what would you say to these kids coming out of dental kindergarten? The, the, these graduates, we're gonna have a whole other. In, can you believe in two more months we're gonna have six thousand more graduates thrown out into the country? What are their options as a new graduate? Well, it's it's been always the same. Uh, depending on the the school you graduated from, you know, it, or part the part of the country you're in, typically, at least generally, what we find is that when they're graduating from dental school, they don't really have the same clinical experiences that we, you and I did when we got out. So, of course, there's always the exception. So you got to go out and and either do a residency program or a specialty uh, a school if that's what you want to go into once in a while you might end up in a private practice. And here's why it's probably better to do a residency program first. Get your feet wet clinically, pick up your speed a little bit. Uh, and, and eventually, when you are ready to buy a practice, that's what the lenders are looking for. You know, one of the things they look for is, okay, you want to buy practice X, and, and practice X is grossing uh, a Y amount. Uh, do you have the capability of producing that same amount? Well, when you're fresh out of school, there's no way you can demonstrate that to see if that's the case or not. So that, that, those couple of years of experience is what the banks really want you to have. And personally, being a teacher at the dental school, uh, I know that's what they need to have because they don't have that same level of experience, especially now with the pandemic. As, as, as you can imagine, because they're graduating and the schools were shut down for all this time. Yeah, you better get out first and do a residency program and sort of get a feel like in especially for general residency program. There might be an area of dentistry you have a little bit more interest in. So wh why not just find out if that's the case? You may want to go on to specialty school or take a lot more courses in that particular field so that when you do have your own practice, general practice, you can offer a lot more uh, of the, the uh, services to the patients. Um, what, is the, um, what is the morale like in school right now, in the dental school? Because you're, you're still faculty at a dental school. What, what is morale like in there? Well, they, they, they're doing okay because they just want to graduate. Uh, but there's also trepidation and concern. Am I, am I going to be able to make it? But you know something? There was always trepidation and concern that existed. Uh, when, when you went out, you, you said, can I run this practice on my own? I was the same way, and I don't know. Maybe you were the same way too. But one thing that did help me, by the way, was go into the Air Force, and I got my feet wet clinically you know, for the four years. Uh, but you know, a lot of the graduates, they're afraid of management that, you know, that's the first thing that we hear from them uh, when we sit down and, and we spend hours with them, you know, just educating them. I don't know if I can run a practice. I, I don't know anything about business. The, that's what they have the trepidations about clinically. Uh, yeah, they, they can do more. They can do more and they can learn more. Uh, but I don't know if it's really different. Maybe the trepidation is over something else now. But it's still there, the fear of practice ownership. And, and you know, and I, I want to say something, um, just an intellectual exercise for the kids. And that is, uh, you know, um, everybody's really good at selling you their idea, what they think is best and all that kind of stuff. But the first sign of intelligence is, well, can you, with the same passion and vigor and intelligence, argue the opposite? Like, you know, um, you know, if you're telling me all the reasons to be a vegan, great. Now tell me all the reasons not to be a vegan. If you only know one side of the argument, you know nothing at all. And a lot of these DSOs are bad, but I'm sure you enjoyed your Air Force experience, right? Yes. And, and, and the residency. So the deal is this. When you're all by yourself alone, it's kind of lonely. And, and um, when I opened up my dental office, it didn't even take six months, and I hired an associate just because I went from 120 kids in school to being all alone. Well, that, that was kind of a, a downshift. And so it starts off as solo. You're all alone. 
And that's where I see the most disease, dysfunction. I mean, if you come to work drunk and you own the place and you have an assistant receptionist hygienist that work for you and you're in your back office, no, no one stands up to you when you do crappy dentistry. No one stands up to you. I think the group practice is a healthier environment. And then when it goes to a group practice in two locations, now you're a, technically a DSO, and from there on out it's just size. But I, when I went to the Marine Corps, the Marines don't have dentists. The Navy does the Marines dentists. And, and in San Diego there's a dental clinic out there with 99 chairs. Those dentists look like they, every time I go there, they're having the most damn fun in the world because it's just a lot more fun when there's 99 dentists, in, you know, in the group than one. And this, and this um, pandemic showed something really interesting. Um, the number of practices for sale listed on Dental Town doubled and, uh, and the DSOs like, Rick Workman told me that his phone was ringing off the hook of people saying, come buy me. And it took a damn global pandemic for people to saying, I don't want to, I don't want to be alone and wear every hat. I mean, it's nice in a group practice. If I could say, um, okay, Barge, you do the staff and, uh, and, and the books and I'll do the supplies or I'll place the implants. You do the clear liners. I mean, it's just nice not to wear so many hats. So my question to you is looking at, did, did, did this, um, pandemic, um, change practice acquisitions? Did it change your business? Do, do more people want to be in a group practice? I know, I know they're selling them and running to DSOs. How did COVID-19 affect your business? That's a loaded question. And you, you gave me a lot of business models in dentistry. And, and that's the beauty, isn't it? That we have those options. But how did it affect it? It really didn't change it that much. You know, those who are looking, here's what did happen. Those who were working as associates or DSOs were, were the first ones to be let go, weren't they? right? Uh, sorry, we, we don't need you. And I, I have to figure out what I'm going to do when I come back. So I think a lot of these associates, the young practitioners realized, you know, something, uh, we have to be in charge of ourselves. I want to have my own business where if, if I'm going to fail, it's because it's going to be because of me. And I'm, if I'm going to get fired, it's, I'm going to fire myself and nobody else is going to fire my, fire me. But you know, there's nothing wrong with having a group practice, a solo practice, or even a DSO. You know, there's there's space for everyone. But all I can I, all I can say is, when I went to school, and I, I would assume that Howard, you you know, you had maybe the same thoughts as well. One of the draws of having your own practice was that you were your own boss. You know, yes, it has a lot of headaches. You got to do everything, but it also has a lot of benefit, doesn't it? So. When, when we do sell practices, it depends. It could be a large group practice, and they might go in as a partner, you know, replacing an, a, an exiting partner. But more often than not, you know, it's, it's not huge practices like that. And, you know, if it is a huge practice, it's going to be maybe replacing one, one potential partner. And then there's nothing that stops you from going in and being a solo practitioner, and you grow your practice to the point where, you know, Maybe I do need a partner, an equal partner. And, and I, I emphasize that word equal. You know, it, you, I, I would never uh, recommend to a young practitioner to go in and be a 30% or a 49% partner because now they have really no control at all. The, the, the majority stockholder is going to be the one that's going to be making all the decisions. And nothing wrong with DSOs if that's your model. You know, I, there's enough people uh, that don't want to run a business. They just want to go work like an employee. Uh, so long as you know up front that, you know, what's the expectation from the DSO of you, basically to produce dentistry. And if you don't mind being managed, and I mean managed sometimes also, by the way, uh, from the treatment planning perspective. And I know this factually by just speaking with a lot of young practitioners who wanted to get out of DSOs because of that, otherwise known as tre uh, creative treatment planning. So it, creative treatment planning, I've never heard that one. Oh, oh my God, can I steal I that I one from you? I wish I could say it's original. <laughs> I, I, it's not original, but I, that's what it is. 
you know, so there, there's a model for all of us. And uh, uh, there's no question because we have our education, we have those picks, right? Uh, you know, the, the term creative treatment planning, I'll tell you, I, I know of a, of a practitioner uh, who's, who was working with a practice that was sold. It, you know, she was the associate. It was sold to a DSO. They make all these promises when they come in. N- never mind that. I'm not here to, uh, to judge DSOs or give you the pros and cons unless I'm asked, you know. But w- when she was doing treatment, you know, they tie in to their, uh, to their management program, the DSO uh, managers. And th- they assign uh, a coach, a dentist coach to each practitioner. And apparently she, she got this call and, and, uh, and you know, the, here's what the discussion was. You know, when you're doing that, you diagnose a few occlusals and you know what happens when you're doing excavation on an occlusal, sometimes the decay goes into the buccal groove or into the lingual groove and things like that. You know what I mean? So that's what they're doing. And th- th- that rubs me the wrong way, especially a- as a teacher where you want to be conservative and you want, and as a dentist, you know, being honest. So some of them get turned off from all that and they leave. And some, they say, okay, you know, it's working for me. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it actually it actually brought up um, another question because, um, I mean, you and I are old school dogs that remember way back in 1997, February, when the most famous magazine in America, the Reader's Digest, had a special issue report how dentists are ripping us off. And they got a um, Nobel laureate, um, I, I mean, a Pulitzer Prize winning author who wrote all this up um, on uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize, William Eckenberg, who um, wrote up the Three Mile Island and was was basically a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He went out and got 30 he went out and got um, FMX study models and went to 30 different dentists. And by God, he got 30 different treatment plans. Yes, and then the, the National Institute of Dental Research said, okay, it, no, this can't be right. These guys are doctors. So, and they, and who, who the hell does 30? They, they wanted 100. So they repeated it and they went to 100. Only two treatment plans were the same. And that was the two same dentists who said you didn't need nothing. But treatment plan three to 100 was all different. So... When you say dentistry is an art and a science, dude, trust me, it's it's more art than science because you couldn't even get two dentists at NYU to agree that today is Tuesday, let alone on a treatment plan. I mean, uh, four by cuspid extraction and orthodontist. I mean, every orthodontist I know says at least a quarter of my patients, there's absolutely no way I can straighten the teeth without removing some bicuspids. And I'd say a quarter of the general dentist would our extremists never have done an ortho case, but say, no, that's impossible. So, so it's, it's very complex, but I, I want to go back to something earlier you said, and that is, um, our partnerships in group practice and marriage, is that kind of the same thing problems and this and that? Because, um, in my 32 years, I can give you the name of a dozen dentists who have been divorced and their partnership broke up and 10 for 10 say, well, you know, the wife divorce was easy because we have kids and family and glue and you don't, you know, you don't, you know, there's a lot of protective things around this family, but the dentist, they just start throwing nuclear bombs at each other and there. I, I, I had one dentist where he sold a partnership to a dentist for 500000 Three years later, it took $600,000 and three years of lawyers to determine that he had to give her 500000 back. So he gave her five thousand dollars, lived in court for three years, and then I mean, I mean, and and here's the other thing: if your spouse annoys you because he chews with his mouth open and he leaves his towel on the floor, you know, it's these little things here and there. But if your dentist is leaving open contacts on fillings and you're seeing it every hour, eight to five, Monday, I mean, it's just. Imagine if the most annoying thing, what is the most annoying thing your wife does to you? Yeah, say it on a podcast. That's, that's a really. There's a nothing really... annoying she does. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, well played, <laughs> sir. But imagine if the most annoying thing your spouse did to you, that they did it to you 
Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, every hour. So, so a lot of people... Myself included, are kind of skeptical. I mean, um, uh, and, and then I see these um, these minority partnerships. These dentists say, "Well, you know, I'm a partner." I'm like, "Well, how much do you own?" Because if it's under fifty percent, if it's forty nine percent, you might as well own point four nine percent. So, right. so will you just go to is mar- and then, then back to that marriage partner thing? So I still, I, I said to dentist, I said, "Did you did you meet your wife?" at 5 o'clock and marry her at 5.30 because they'll call me back up and they'll say, well, I'm going back to where I grew up and there's three dentists looking for an associate. One pays 25%, um, but pays the lab bill. The other one's 30%, but I have to pay half the lab bill. But the other one, the, and, I, and I'm like, dude, you just told me three analytical things. What what if one dentist has been divorced four times and has staff turnover every two years? What if the other dentist has just got out of rehab for the four time? What if the other ones just has a anger manager? I mean, I mean, and, and you just came back with three quantitative deals. I mean, I mean, if that was right, I would think match.com, you would just enter your data and it would find your wife in one nanosecond. Oh, oh my God, we found her. Obviously, it's Sarah, you know. So, do you see? Um, I mean, if, if I was going to marry someone, I'd sure as hell want to date them for six months at least. Uh, I would want to work with them. I would be more concerned about the dentist I was going to practice with. Of, you, you know how you when you're eating, there's two types of dentists you eat with. One of you is just so loving and nice, and you just you just love the guy. But every time the waitress does something wrong, he just turns her and rips her a new one. You're like, oh my god. And you're looking for that that guy who's nicer to the waitress than he is to you if, if he's trying to sell you something or get something from you or whatever. But, I mean, it's it's such a complex decision. And so many dentists, they come out of school and it's just like, well, what, what do you pay? What, 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 what's my percentage? Is it a, adjustable or is it a pe-? And it's like they don't get into the psychographics of, dude, this is a long-term relationship. That's a big, big topic. There's a lot to it. I I can just tell you how we approach it. And then from from that, uh, you can ascertain uh, what you wish. So let's say we're going to replace a partner or the the practice is so big they want a partner to add to their practice. The first step we do is we spend a lot of time with each one of our clients, get to know them. You know, it's, it's not... You know, you don't, they don't fill out a personality thing, but you, you speak with them and find out what's their goal. What are they li- really looking for? What do they want? Do they really want an equal partner or do they just want somebody that's going to come and do some work? And the same thing happens with the buyers, a uh, potential buyer or potential partner. We want to understand their personality as well. So we don't end up introducing just anyone to a practice as a potential partner. Uh, we're doing our own screening uh, ourselves just from the conversations we're having with them. And then once we do that, you know, we we now discuss it with the the host. We'll call the person who's looking to take on a partner the host. We'll discuss it with the host and say, look, this person uh, graduated such and such school. Uh, This is the procedures they like to do. Here's their hobbies. Uh, here's their family background, you know, as far as, you know, they, do they have children? Uh, are they, you know, have they just moved to an area? We try to give as much information as we can. And then we say, we recommend that you just have a meeting. And then we let them have a meeting let, uh, by themselves, you know, that maybe two or three hours those things last. And they can maybe sometimes meet a second time where all, first thing we say, discuss your dental philosophies. You know, first, number one, try to assess each other's character traits. Is this a person that you, basically that's our date, but obviously they're not going to date for, for a whole year. One of the other things we believe in is that typically, okay, you go and work for that person for 30 days with no commitment, okay? If you can't figure out somebody's character traits and clinical, uh, I, I guess, capabilities, in 30 days, I don't think you're going to be able to do it in 60 days or six months. In 30 days, I think you can know. So let's say we extend it to 60 days. That's fine. So you have that opportunity. But remember, you're not marrying the person. You're, you're not there with them 24-7. 
or just about 24 seven. It's a business relationship, just like any other business. So how do you protect that? How do you uh, determine what will happen if you have a spat or if you're not pulling your own weight? And that's where it comes to the operating agreement. I mean, we, you know, when, when we put things together, we even provide all that, you know, as part of our services, uh, whatever operating agreement there is. So in there, it spells every different scenario. So if, if I, you and I are partners, Howard, and I, and for after two or three years, I start slacking off or I start taking uh, more vacation time, which is the one of the more common things that happens by the way, in, in partners are breaking up. Uh, then the provisions are there as to how am I going to be treated? And then the other thing we don't agree on, which always, you know, what, what's the biggest thing people fight over is money, right? Uh, in most partnerships, they just end up splitting the profit, no matter how much work you do. Well, we don't set up our partnerships that way. It's basically you're the employee of the uh, organization uh, of the, uh, the corporation and you get paid a certain percentage from that corporation. So you do more work, you get more money. Uh, so the, the, I, I guess the, the nutshell is that all those things that you described so well can, uh, can really be avoided or can be addressed before you become partners. So that all you have to go is to go to the manual and say, okay, this happened and our agreement that we, we came to says, if this happens, this is going to be the result. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And um, I don't really know if I uh, believe these Myers-Briggs personality tests because the first time I took the test, it said I was a psychopath. And the second time, it said I was a sociopath. So I... Uh, That's close. That's close. <laughs> is it close? Okay. Well, it was okay, so it was close. Um, um, so um, the the what, what I tell Dennis is that... Um, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if you say, I, I really, um, because from a business point of view, you got to get good at something. I'm not saying you have to specialize, but that was the first thing you said is, uh, during this pandemic, it's a great time to specialize. Well, actually it's, it's, it's been a great time to specialize since 1900. I mean, 1900, there were no specialties and healthcare was 1% of GDP by 2000. Um, it was, um, uh, the MDs had 58 specialties. We had eight and healthcare was at 14% of the economy. Now it's 2020 and the uh, dentists are up to uh, 12 specialties, and the uh, healthcare is up to 17% of the GDP. We got oral surgery, endo, perio, pediatric dentist, ortho, pros, dental anesthesia, oral facial pain, oral med, oral path, oral radiology, public health. But the bottom line is, is you know, quality is everything. And if you and I were going to get a root canal done, well, you wouldn't go to a dental student at NYU, and you wouldn't go to a general dentist. You'd find... Um, you're out there in, in New York. You'd, you'd probably go to the greatest endodontist that Manhattan had to offer. Well, the religion says treat other people like you want to be treated. Um, if uh, if I do the molar endo, Delta is only going to give me about six fifty. But if the endodontist does it, he's going to get about double. So from a business point of view, paying an associate twenty five percent of six fifty for a molar is the same thing as paying an endodontist fifty percent of twelve hundred. Um, and the and look at the pay. Average dental specialist three twenty. Average general dentist one ninety seven. Um, dentists who own their practice two forty four. Dentists who employ their practice one hundred forty seven. So if you're ever wondering, well, how much money could I make a year after having an associate? Well, the macroeconomic data tells you you could probably make about a hundred thousand dollars a year per head of dentist work for you. Oral surgeons make the most four forty eight. Periodontist three thirty. Endo three oh seven. Pediatric dentist. God forbid. I'd rather just. I'd rather serve solitary confinement, uh, uh, especially if they could get me in a, um, you know, pediatric dentistry. God love them. I don't know what the hell went wrong in your childhood, but orthodontist 29. So what I'm telling the kids is you got to get good at something. And if you're not good in business, well, maybe you should be looking for an associate job of someone who's good in business. If you say, well, I really want to get into implants. Well, then go get a job for someone who's really into implants. But find a mentor and realize that you're not going to make the rewards until you really get good at something. If you're going to be an all jack of all trades and be, you know, be just 
everything to everybody. Um, you're going to work hard, and you're going to, you know, you're going to make under two hundred thousand dollars a year. With that being said, um, when you um, when when you're looking for that mentor, you know, find out that. But with that being said, um, to me, it looks like when they get out of school and they go get a job as an associate. And I'm not throwing DSOs under a bus because the DSOs probably practice the same. I don't care if you're an associate for a DSO or you're associate for good old Mr. Harry up the street. They change jobs every year. I mean, I've never met a kid out of dental school five years that's worked in the same place for five years. And to me, it looks like they just keep going from job to job to job to job until they get so depressed that they lose all their fear of free enterprise and say, at this point, I don't care if I if I die. I'm, I'm going to set up my own office because I don't even care what happens because I'm not going back to the five last places I worked. Do you see that too? Or is that totally different in New York versus No, I mean, first of all, we're national, you know, so, you know, we, we have experiences from all over the country. But, you know, the, the, the fact that you said uh, a lot of the associates, you know, or you talk with, they, they end up changing jobs on a yearly basis. Well, I don't know if you're aware as to why they're changing their jobs, where they promised something when they went in. So I, all I can tell you is, the, the buyers, the clients that I used to speak with when I was doing the full consulting and our other consultants do. W one of the first things they, they might tell us is, you know, I was promised uh, to get equity in this practice when I became an associate. And it was all done on a handshake. You, you, you know, the famous line, let's practice a, uh, together a little bit and see how things work out, right? You know, so, and we have found in all these years that we've been doing this and the experiences we had that 90% of the time, if that's what they're going in for, not just a job, you know, if, if they're going in and hoping to have equity in that practice one day, it, then 90% of the time they fail. It doesn't happen because nothing is formally formalized from the beginning. You know, it's just a handshake. And if, if I'm in charge, if I, if this is my practice, and I hired you as an associate, you're working there, I can say, hey, I think he likes it here. Uh, I think this is the time when I can strike. And I'll say, Howard, let's sit down and talk. How do you establish the value? Uh, is, is it gonna be full uh, buy-in? Is it gonna be partnership buy-in? Uh, all these things start coming up and negotiations start. So, and of course, it always comes down to the price of the practice, isn't it? So let's say, you know, my, my practice, I, I took you on, and before I took you on, I was grossing a million, and I needed some help. And then you come on, and be, after a year, let's say you're responsible for producing 200,000 more. Let, let's call it 400,000 more. So after a year, I say, I, I guess I think Howard is doing fine. Howard, let's sit down and talk. What do you think I'm going to value my practice on? Is it going to be the 1 million or is it going to be the 1.4 million? Invariably, as a host, I say, of course, I want to value my practice on 1.4. But how about you? You're going to tell me, uh, you know, I, I was responsible for that 400,000. So why should I pay for what I just grew for you, right? So, uh, you know, we, we look at it as, as I'm sure, I don't know if you know, but we're dual representation. So we're looking at it from the fairness perspective. For both. Now, when you say dual representation, that means you're representing both. Yes, buyer okay. and seller. Yeah. Okay, so I, I love you to death. I asked you to come on the show. You didn't ask me, but you have to be aware, and you obviously know that attorneys don't like that. Attorneys, they, they want to go to war. They want to say, okay, I'm going to protect Howard, and this one's going to protect Barge, and then we're going to go to war and bill it out at $400 an hour, and we're, we're going to make a mountain out of a molehill. So um, you and your firm, you say, no, we, we the, the, let's, let's work together. Let's do a deal. Let's represent both. Uh, but you obviously know the one million attorneys in the United States um, don't like that. So what, what, do you, what, do you say to, what do you say to all the attorneys who say dual representation? If you're going to represent both, you represent no one is what they're going to say. Right. Look, don't misunderstand me. We're not representing them from the legal perspective at all. No, no. You know, what we're, what we're doing is we're acting as the mediators and facilitators. 
okay, Howard, you have a practice. Let me analyze your practice. And I think this is the value of practice. I mean, we, we have a lot of information we require, not just tax return, a lot, okay? And then I come to you and I say, Howard, this is the valuation. And by the way, we don't even negotiate on the market value of the practice, either with the seller or the buyer. And then I also am going to represent the buyer and say, I think this is a good return on investment. Here are the reasons why. So all we're doing is making sure that it's an amicable type of a transition. And all we're doing is representing in the sense that is this good for you as, uh, and is this good for you? But when it comes to the legal aspect of it, no, we're not attorneys. We don't do that. You know, we'll help them, you know, with, with some with the, the contract work as far as producing it for them. And then we say, ultimately, you got to show it to your attorneys to get their blessing. So but let's get back to the original question. And I, I want to make sure that we're not doing it, you know, legal representation. But how you've heard of mediation, right, Howard? Mediation. Who created mediation? It's attorneys that created mediation. There's divorce mediation, where you get in front of one person and both have to agree to that. And by the way, both our clients have to agree to be under this type of a relationship where we're you know, representing both. So when you have divorce mediation, they both have to agree and accept the results of that person. And they don't really have to accept it. They could also walk away. Uh, so it's not an unheard of thing. To, to, to represent both so long as you're acting as a fiduciary for both and doing the right thing. And that's where integrity comes in. But is it, 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 it's really no different than being a clinician, isn't it? That uh, you, you're sort of representing the patient and yourself at the same time, and you got to do the right thing for that patient. And you got to earn that trust. And we have to earn that trust too. And uh, there are people who don't want it any other way. You know, there, I, I had clients who said, uh, I, I like this method so much. I'm going to wait until you find the right practice for me. I'm just going to obtain a practice for you. So, and there are those who don't want to deal with this because there are those who say, yeah, like you said, I'm going to get my own advisors and they're going to get the most for me, but therein lies the, the, you know, the failure. When you try to get the most for yourself, that's when it becomes uh, an adversarial type relationship. And, and that's where the transition usually doesn't happen as smoothly. Uh, the proof is in the pudding with us. Nationally, once we transition to practice because of you know, this uh, dual representation and a whole bunch of other things we do, the, the patient retention rate is 90 to 95% because everybody's happy. They, you know, they, they, they got what they, they were told they're going to get. Of course, they're going to do their own due diligence too. So I don't think it's an issue at all. And it's worked, uh, you know, since we've started and it's worked. Um, okay. So I'm going to go back to you asked question. Why are they changing jobs? Well, just the students, just the young dentist out of school five years less on my job um, that I've podcasted, you know, a dozen of them. They say things like, um, well, I was working on a poor guy and he could barely pay for this root canal. So I thought while he was numb, I would go ahead and do charity dentistry and do the filling behind it in front of it for free to try to help this guy out. And the office manager said, absolutely not. And then charged the guy. And he's like, you're telling me I can't do charity dentistry with two spills of amalgam that costs a dollar each. Um, another one is a huge one is they don't trust because um, the processes aren't um, transparent or whatever, but you know they see that, that the crown's a thousand dollars, but then they see adjusted production at six fifty. They just keep seeing all these adjustments to their production, and when they get their paycheck, it looks like I they've showed them to me. You'd have to be a damn computer programmer to know what the hell is going on. So they they lost the trust, and and then of course they're young and they're naive and they're green and they always live in this perfect wonderful world, a Wally world. Well, if I owned it, I would do everything. I guess I can't tell you the funniest joke I've ever had is over the years about two or three. No, it was, it was three different dentists that worked for me. M most of the associates, you know, they stay with you six or seven years and I've been there 32 years. I've had a lot of associates and, and there, we have two types of associates. You're either out in a year or you stay six or seven. And a lot of them that say six or seven came back and said, you know what? I, when I left you, I said, you know, when I leave, I'm going to change it. I'm not going to, your way was too, ah, I'm, I'm going to do it this sweet Disney World way. 
And then they said, yeah, it sucked because over the years they started turning into Howard and realizing that, you know, you can't live in Wally world. It, it's, it's a tough world out there. But I want to go back to the kids because I graduated May 11, 87, and got my office open September uh, 11. Um, no, that would be 9-11. Um, but anyway, graduated May 11 and got my office open. I think, I think it was September 11. Uh, and um, my gosh, um, four months. I mean, I was open. And now these kids, I mean, they take five flipping years. They go from job to job. And they say things like, they, they have all these self-limiting beliefs. They have all these, one of them is, well, I can't get a loan with this student loan. I went to, I went to AT Still. I went to Midwestern. I went to a private school. My God, I'm $400,000 in debt. No one's going to touch me. So number one, I'm going to start with that. Do I have too much student loan debt to go buy an office? You know something? The, I, I, I hope that they hear what I'm going to tell them right now. The banks know the students have all these debts. They're still loaning them 110%, up to 110% of the purchase price. So it, it's, it, that's a myth. That, you know, it, it does exist. By the way, the DSOs also tell the same thing to the, uh, to the practices they want to buy, that these students can't get, get, can't get any loans. Nothing further from the truth. The, the, you know, the banks love dentists because we're a great business model, like you said before. Howard, do you know what the default rate is on transition loans? Less than 1%. Bingo. And if they know, why would a bank, why would a bank, knowing that the students have the average of 400000 depending on whatever school they went to, why would they still loan that amount if they didn't think it was a good bet? Plus, it all comes down to, you know, to the cash flow as well. So we're not going to take a, a practitioner that can't produce a certain amount of dentistry and put them in a $2 million practice if they can only do five hundred. But we also have to demonstrate when we do our pro forma to the bank, okay, if they get 110% financing, that's with the, you know, with the working capital, this is going to be the pre-tax cash flow for them after they pay off your debt and all the, all the expenses of the practice. And with that, they're still loaning. It, so that's not a problem at all. And once, you know, it's much better than staying an associate. I think the ADA had done a, a study where those who get started uh, earlier with their own practices over their career have a much better chance of making 200 to 500,000 more at that time. Because if you start from scratch and that's what many of them do that, but just being an associate, you're already behind the eight ball. You know, you're not making, like you said, what the, your potential is by owning your own business. And I would also like to say that the, um, the reason the default rate is so high is because dentists got in bed with the mob about a hundred years ago. And they, um, the, the federal government closed down all the dental schools, all the med schools, everything, and set up a state board in each state and said, you can't have a medical school or dental school unless the state board authorizes it. When you graduate, they, they, they control your license and they can take it away. So the state board became the judge, the jury, and the executioner. In 1900, health care was 1% of cost. And that's why you have no bankruptcy because you have no competition. I'll give you examples. I practice in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, when you go down to Yuma, Arizona and cross into Mexico, it's called Molar City. And that's where all the Americans are down there getting dentistry for half the price. And I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation. And when one of them dentists comes up here and sets up in Guadalupe where they got 25,000 Mexican-Americans who don't have one dental office in the town and he sets up and starts practicing there, well, they call the police and they kidnap and arrest him and put him in a cage and deport them. Do you know how many dentists from India alone would be here tomorrow if it was legal? So the only reason you make $200,000 a year is not because you're a genius, not because you're smart, not because of all the bullshit you tell yourself. It's because the government 
broke the system, um, and you're the beneficiary of it, and they bro- they have broken it so bad. Now the same government that broke it is saying, "Oh, it's so broken that we we need to take it over, and we we need socialized medicine." And we we I mean, it, you're you're so damn dumb that if you go that route, I I actually hope you do it just because maybe you'll learn the lesson. I mean, the government's the one who comes up with a baseball bat, breaks your legs, and then tells you you're lucky because they're going to give you a wheelchair at half off. Okay, if you if Bernie Sanders is listening, if you want to solve all the health care problems, close down all the state board of dental examiners because they're the only reasons doctors, the oral surgeon, the average is 448. I know an oral surgeon out here in Arizona just graduated. He his base pay was 350 and his first year income was 750. Okay, 750,000 net first year out of school. Now, do you think that's a sign of a competitive industry? No. And who goes bankrupt in dentistry? Again, it's back to the state board. They took your license away. And why did they take your license away? Well, it's going to be about 80% Budweiser. It's going to be 15% Vicodin and 5% cocaine. So, and, and I see all of those as diseases. I mean, if you wake up in the morning and your best idea is to drink a pint of vodka, there's something wrong with you, dude. You're sick, and all you need to do is raise your hand. Because 30 years ago, when the board caught you doing that, they took you to church and spanked you, beat you, took your license away. And it took 30 years to say, no, this is not a moral problem. This is a disease, and um, and that's a whole nother deal. But I'm, I'm just telling you that... Um, um, just open up your own damn office because I know dentists. The only companies that have a million employees is where you used to work in the Air Force or Walmart. And you can have a million employees if they're all 25 and under. But when you get a million employees and they're all dentists, physicians, and lawyers, well, look at government. Everyone in that government is a lawyer. Do you ever see them agree with each other? Have you ever showed a treatment plan to another dentist who's your best alcoholic drinking friend and he agreed with it? I've never seen two dentists agree on anything. So if you're a dentist, you're, 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 a, you, they, somewhere you went into school, a little cute puppy dog and you came out a cat and cats are finicky. And all I know about dentists is this is man, they, they, they like their own cage Uh, They like their own place and just buy a damn dental office. And if you do, um, are that 1% where they're going to take your license away. Well, I'd rather you find out you're an alcoholic at 25 and have to pee in a cup and go through a program and and solve that disease at 25 instead of figuring that out at 65. Um, So there's no competition. Okay, here's here's um, another thing that just, this is what grinds my wheels. They come out of these two schools in my backyard. I knew their dad before they were born, right? And I say, okay, you got $400,000 of debt. Go back home and move in with your mom and dad and live in the basement and go work two jobs and put all the money and save up all the money. And they they, they don't. And then they, I say, well, go buy that practice. They go, well, I've already got $400,000 in debt. I'm not going to go buy a practice for $700,000 in debt. And then the next time I see them, guess why I see them? Because I'm getting invited to their new home party and they just bought a home in Gilbert for $400,000 and I'm like what the hell you wouldn't spend seven fifty dollars buying a practice you wouldn't live with your dad and mom for free and now you just bought a $450,000 house and if you and do you think you can bring a wife home to a $450,000 home and she says I like it as is doesn't need a thing no paint no furniture nothing just we're just gonna move in with some lawn chairs why do they balk at buying a practice for seven fifty and then decide they're going to buy a three hundred fifty thousand dollars home instead? What because, would you say to that kid? Because they don't, they're, they're not educated on this. Look, when you and I came out of school, we had I had no idea how, what are you supposed to do when you're looking for a practice and such. So all they see is the number. But here's the education I want to give them: just this one point. Buying that seven hundred fifty thousand dollar practice is going to enable you to pay off your student loan and be able to buy a house and have a living because you're going to have an income from that. So you they they shouldn't look at that purchase of a practice loan 
as bad debt. If anything, it's good debt. The, you know, the house, it just, you know, drains your money, doesn't it? it you got to fix this. You got to fix that. It might appreciate, but some of them go out and buy these really expensive sports cars and things like that, which is a depreciating asset. But with a, with a practice purchase, what you've done basically is, is bought something that's producing money for you. That's there. So uh, that's the first thing you buy. You, you buy the means to be able to, to do the other things that you want to do in life. Um, my gosh. Um, and the other thing about the hope, the home is, I think the saddest day of everyone's life is when you finally get each room all fixed up. Everything's carpeted. All the furniture is finally beautiful. I had no idea. They go back to the first room and start redoing that one. It never, ever stops ever. Um, another thing is, um, what, what is a good litmus test? I mean, I don't want to, I, the obvious thing is this. When you go around the world and you look at DSOs, like I just podcasted a guy um, yesterday who owns the largest DSO in India. It's almost all women dentists. Um, when you go in America, the DSOs, two out of three dentists in there that stay are women. Um, whenever there's a big change in demographics, usually there's a big change to follow in the market. I mean, you couldn't go from changing a country from all boys, all girls without lots of things changing. But, um, you know, some guys like me would say the litmus test for DSO is, well, if you like giving orders, you should own your own practice. And if you're shy, quiet, and humble and rather take orders, you, you should be an employee dentist. Um, do you think going from 20% graduating women dentists to half is going to affect the DSO market? Um, some things I've already seen about the DSOs that they've even said on this program, they've, when people say DSOs are going to take over dentistry, dude, the CEOs have come on this show and said they're, they're, they're not going rural. Um, they can't get any workers for rural. So you, you, in 1945, you came out of college and you had five and a half kids and you started making them at 18. Now you've backed that up a decade and you have half as many kids. So they're coming out of dental school. They're still single. They still want to have kids, which means they need to find a mate. And if you were going to find a primate to mix gametes with, would you rather go to Eloy, Arizona with a thousand people or Phoenix with a million? You increase your odds of a gamete producer near you in a big town. So the DSOs say, when we look at our portfolio of rural practices on any given day, 10% of them don't even have a dock in the box. Um, they're illiquid assets. These dentists that go to sell a, a practice in a town of 5,000, sometimes they just walk away from it. Um, so it looks like they're, they're, um, the DSOs are only going urban. They're not going rural. Some people say that, well, that's a better place to practice because there's less competition. So the bottom line is I threw nine questions at you to see if any of them were good enough to answer. Um, how, how would you take a stab at that? Girls versus guys, urban versus rural? Well, you're, you're, you're right with the urban and the rural. Uh, as far as, you know, everybody seems to want to be in the urban areas, the metropolitan areas. Uh, but the rural is, is like a well-kept secret where the profit is, is phenomenal. On, on a rural area because of the uh, lower cost of living in those areas. And, you know, w we always say, too, rural is good. You don't have to live in that town. There's usually, you know, maybe within a half an hour, there's probably a major city in that area, too, if that's what you want. But as far as women uh, in the DSOs, I, I think even before the DSOs came, one of the things we, we did end up seeing was that there were less women who wanted to be practice owners for some of the reasons that you just mentioned. So it might be a, a place, you know, for them to, you know, to go in and start working. Uh, also just to be associated in private practices as well. But here, here's where I, you know, you, you said, what are the things that would prevent you from uh, maybe practicing with DSOs? Uh, it would be my uh, professional independence. You know, I, I, I don't want anyone telling me how to how to diagnose and how to treat uh and and i think in those cases because uh it, it's such a huge i i guess business that they have to have the managers in place and normally those managers are not dentists either you know they have those people in place 
and they're under pressure to keep producing, uh, as we discussed before. So if if it's if it's against your grain to be pressured to produce dentistry where you think you might have to be creative in the treatment planning, as we said before, then the DSOs are not for you uh, at all. Uh, and, and then, you know, you might end up having your own practice where you can control your own shots. Why not be, be, find somebody of like mind and become a partner? It doesn't have, you know, when you're partners, it doesn't mean that it's a huge practice. You know, if, if you don't want to work as many days uh, in your own personal practice, why not establish a practice for five days and you find a partner and, you know, you take two and a half days and you take the other two and a half days. So you still can have both of, both, uh, of the worlds in, in saying, okay, I'm, I'm in control of my own domain, but at the same time, I'm, I'm going to have time to do, I guess, everything else that life is demanding of me. I don't know yeah. if that answered that question at all. For yeah, you. I, I mean, basically, there's 168 hours in a week. So the average dentist works 32 hours a week. So you divide that by 168, and the de- average dentist is open 19% of the week. So that means four out of five hours, your office, rent, mortgage, equipment, build out computer, insurance, malpractice, profile, it's all paid for, and it's idle four out of five hours a week. Eight and a half percent of emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin. And when you get that partner, my God, you don't need twice as many chairs. You need to be open twice as many hours. So when you tell me that you have four operatories and you need to tear it all down and rebuild one with eight, I say, well, you obviously didn't ask your patients that question because they're all at the emergency room. And that's why I love DSOs because, I know, I'm more worried about my um, – um, grandchildren than I am about anything else. And I don't want this sovereign profession of dentistry turned over to insurance companies. When Cigna was going around buying their own dental office, I thought, well, that's a really bad idea. Because if you go to a Cigna dentist and it's owned by the Cigna insurance company, well, where's my daughter going to know when she needs a damn dentist? You know, and if they're all bought by Wall Street, I mean, I don't want um, Taylor Marie Ferran going to a dentist where they see every MOD amalgam as a crown opportunity. I want her to go to a damn dentist, not a Wall Street broker. So if, if Wall Street owns the dental offices and the insurance company owns the dental offices, well, I guess my kids will have to go to Mexico to find a damn dentist, you know, to go to. Uh, I The dentist needs to retain independence and 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 uh and all that kind of stuff and as far as the the treatment planning goes i i gave up on treatment planning 30 years ago i mean my god on dental town every time someone ever posts an x-ray it'd be like a full set of teeth and be like one chip say what would you do and i'm like i don't know i'd smooth it out next person i'd veneer all the teeth next one's like no she needs ortho then invisalign then veneers and then it's like i mean it's like good god i mean um so yeah, that the Reader's Digest nailed it in 1979. I mean, if you go to 30 different dentists, you're going to get 30 different opinions. Uh, but I, here's here's another big one for you. And as far as urban or rural, I'll tell you this. I grew up in urban, I, I mean in Wichita, Kansas, where me and John Lease, who's an endodontist out there in L.A., we went from seventh grade to the end of dental school. Me, John Lease, um, Alan Tebold. Uh, we went all the way from seventh grade to the end of dental school. And whenever we'd go to each other's house, we'd ride our motorcycle to each other's house. Yeah, move to Phoenix and do that. The, the cops bring your kid home. Your kid was riding a motorcycle. And it's like, dude, it's Saturday. Was there a problem? There was never, he never did anything wrong. He didn't hurt. No one, you know, it, it was just, it was just like, well, it's a, it's a, it's an arrestable offense, but I love the, uh, the urban areas, and my four boys saw their cousins growing up in Kansas, and now I notice they moved out rural so they could have horses, go-karts. Like, when I go to my son's house now, we have a bonfire, light fireworks, we can do all this. You do all that in Phoenix, and there's like going to be a helicopter hovering over your head. So I love the rural, and, and I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Listen to this closely. You got $400,000 of student loans? Every dentist I know that came out of school and paid them off in one year, they went and found a practice two hours away from where a Southwest Airlines plane takes off. There's no competition. They don't have to sign up for any insurance. Pew um, Research um, is a 
global um, philanthropy thing that was doing oceans, um, but they, um, they, they moved in from not just oceans, but now healthcare. They've done all the legwork. If you go to pewresearch.org, they already show you all the counties in America that do not have a dentist. Then they show you all the counties that are underserved. And then they show you all the big cities, which are all oversaturated. And who's the only one that will go there? It's only Mormons. Because mm-hmm. they already found a mate. They already have a kid. They don't need a bar. They don't need a nightlife. And, and they'll go find... Uh, you know, they'll go find a county in Iowa that doesn't have a dentist. They'll go in there, sign up for no insurance, thousand for a crown, thousand for a partial, thousand for just everything's a thousand or five hundred, and they just make bank. And their kids can shoot fireworks and ride mini bikes. And we're um, Phoenix was the um, the ground central for um, Google and uh, uh, for their driverless cars. And the five year study was over. We finished it here in Phoenix. Well, I've been watching driverless cars for five years. No wrecks. No one died. Everything was fine. Imagine that you, um, I see the dentist doing the reverse commute. Though They wake up in a suburb where there's about a dentist for every 2,000 people. And then they commute 45 minutes into downtown Phoenix. And when they get out of their car, now there's a dentist for every 500 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and if and the ones that get up and they commute out of town, they drive an hour out of town. They find some city of a thousand people, so the draw is always twice as many. They're the only dentists in the town. They don't take any of the insurance crap, and they just make bank. And when it comes to driver's car, imagine this: I told you two hours away from an airport is where every first year dentist I've ever seen that passed a million in collections. And took home over 350, first year out of school. It was always at least two hours away from where an airplane take off. But imagine we driverless cars now. Mm-hmm. So you got to, your first patient's at eight and you're two hours away. The alarm goes off at six. All you do is take your blanket and your little teddy bear and just walk out, get laid down in your driverless box car and go back to bed. Two hours later, ding, ding, you're there, go to work. Or you could sit there and do your whatever you do at home on your PC or computer or watch a movie. So every everything's massively changing. But here's my question for you. A lot of these guys that aren't afraid of work, that aren't afraid of the risk, that are willing to work hard and hustle, and usually that means they have a kid. I, I mean, I've seen this my whole life. They're party, fun, wild animals, and the minute they drop a baby... Now they're as serious as a heart attack and they're ready to do their dad thing and mom thing and work their butt off. But they always wonder, should I just start one from scratch or should I buy? How do you wrap your experience around that decision? It depends where. Like you mentioned, there there are parts of the country and there is less and less of those that are really in need of, of uh, practitioners. They might even get the place set up for them. Uh, but... There's less and less of that. So if you're going to do it in an urban area, a metropolitan area, or, or just like the you know, I guess suburban area, it's almost like suicide to start it on your own. I don't have to tell you, you, you pro- obviously you know that, you know, just the, the minimum cost of starting a, a practice of your own from scratch, just from equipment, just a two-chair office maybe. It's got to be 150 to, to 250 at least, right? So, but the problem is, where are the patients? You know, you, you, the, the equipment itself does not produce the income unless you got bodies in the chair. And that's what we find, that typically when you start your own practice from scratch, it takes two or three years just to, to make some kind of a, I guess, enough of an income that you say, okay, this is worth it. Uh, so, and it's not because by the way, we're in the business of selling practices. Uh, you know, if there was somebody, I would tell them, look, you want to go to this very rural area, uh, you know, start on your own, you'll do fine. But the reality is it's not as many of those left. So yeah, it, it is much better to either become a partner into a practice or purchase a practice because you're going to hit the ground running. It's a proven track record for that practice. You know, the, the patients are there. The, the work is there, the staff is there, 
and, and you're going to make good. And, you know, one of the biggest fears, I think we also come across with, with potential buyers and it's a legitimate fear because they don't know any better. Just like I didn't know better. How am I going to keep all these patients? Are those patients going to stay with me? Because the, the, you know, the, the thought process is that, uh, especially if it's a fee for service, well, they're going to that practitioner because they want that practitioner. But the reality is, and, and again, we have found this out that as so long as you follow the guidelines we give you, in other words, don't over treatment plan the first time, don't fire uh, staff members when you go in, don't change the core of the practice. If you do the right things, or at least for the first year, you're going to retain those patients. You're going to have that type of retention. We even figure out what percent of, a, of the practice's income a, you know, a, a buyer has to lose to break even. We do all those calculations in our analysis. And it's typically between you know, 45 to 60%. And you know, typically, I would ask my, uh, the, the buyer, look them in the eyes and say, uh, when, when you have a new patient that comes to you as an as a associate, what percent of the time do they follow up with treatment with you? And it's, you know, they would tell us, you know, 90, 95% of the time. I said, fine. Just remember that when you take over a practice, first of all, you've been uh, endorsed by the seller. Secondly, because, you know, the, the staff is going to get to know you and, you know, they want to stay with you, they're going to uh, convince the patients to stay with you. And the, the reality is, those patients would have had to go someplace anyway. So they're going to give you one shot. And if you treat them just like you treat your new patients right now, you're going to have a much better percentage chance of holding on to them, you know? And, and the number, by the way, in order for them to break even, it's somewhere between 45 and 60% of the practice income has to be lost. And they can't be that bad, you know, to, to do that, you know, to, to lose all those patients. A lot. Of, let's switch from the young kids to the old old farts. The old like, farts are all like, like, hey, we both graduated in dental school in eighty seven. So no, I is, graduated in seventy nine, so I'm ten years older than you are. But a lot of the um, a lot of the older dudes say, if you're going to sell your practice, that you'll get the best price from a DSO. Don't sell it to an individual, some young dumb kid. Sell it to a DSO. They get all the money and they pay the most price. True or false? False. Here's what they tell you. And by the way, it's true at the outset. And I've experienced this personally, you know, with some, some people that I know. Uh, they, they'll tell you, we'll pay 100% of your last year's gross collections. But when it comes to the contracts, and they only use their contracts, they're going to have a provision in there that says, but we're going to hold back 20 to 30% of that sale price. And in order for you to collect that over the next two or three years, 10% at a time, depending on, on the, the provisions, you, the practice has to con continue to produce what you were producing when you sold the practice to us. Now, there's several reasons why people want to sell their practice. Number one, they're getting tired. You know, physically, it's difficult for them to keep up with all the work that they have to do. And, and, and secondly, you know, the practices, at least that we deal with, they're mostly fee-for-service and the PPOs that have the better fee schedules. Well, when you get to a DSO, all of a sudden now, they belong to a myriad of insurance companies, right? And those insurance companies have the lower fee schedules too. So here you are trying to do the same amount of work at a lower fee schedule, so at most of the time, you're not going to even end up collecting that 20 to 30 percent. And here's another place where they lose. It's the asset allocation. I, I, I'm sure you know the asset allocation where there's the goodwill and the hard assets. Well, when, when we're doing our asset allocation, that's another point we don't negotiate on with either party. It's 80 percent to goodwill and 20 percent to hard assets. The reason is goodwill is taxed as, as long-term capital gain. So the net proceeds to a sale becomes a lot more to the seller. But when it, when it ends up in a DSO or any other transition many times, it, it could be 50-50. So you end up actually paying more in taxes to the federal and the state uh, the government. So no, uh, look, there's always the exception. I always say there's always an exception to every rule. Maybe somebody does collect that other uh, 
20%. But there's so many other things, obstacles that are put in your way to prevent that from happening. Um, well said, well said. Um, and here, here's a question that's just never going to go away. It was the biggest question in 87. It's the biggest question today. I'm, I know it'll be the biggest question a thousand years from now. Should I own the real estate? Or should I own the practice? Um, it's two different things. Um, should you should you buy both or one or the other? Eventually, you can buy both. Okay. So our advice in those in- instances with our clients is, if you can avoid purchasing the the real estate now, don't, because with real estate acquisitions now. They st- they have to come down with some down payments, you know. It, it's not one hundred ten percent financing with real estate as well. Secondly, it becomes a bigger nut to swallow as well. And in our in our case, it introduces the negotiation part of it. I had one example in in my career where the real estate had to be sold because it was a home office, and they of course they were okay to go ahead with the sale of the practice, but they couldn't come to terms with the, the, the price on the real estate. So everything fell apart. And I, I know the practitioner for at least five years hadn't sold the practice still for that reason. So what do we recommend? You know, go ahead and buy the practice and we'll, you know, get a, a lease agreement together with the seller who happens to be the owner of the real estate itself and then have a provision in there, you know, like the option to buy, uh, at, you know, after so many years or the first right of refusal. And, and then once you own the practice, then at that point, you're going to be in a better position to buy that real estate. And eventually you can uh, buy the real estate. Uh, you may not want to be a, a property owner either. So overall, I would say just hold off buying the real estate unless you have to unless there's no other way of buying the practice. I always felt that when you and I got out of school, it was more the golden years. And my golden years, I meant that we were just going from um, amalgams and PFMs to, you know, uh, uh, full gold crowns and amalgams to PFMs or whatever. But um, I always felt like if we came out of school and we made a couple of bad mistakes, it didn't matter. It really wasn't going to follow you for 10, 20, 30 years. But I, I am, uh, you, you could go to the wrong city. You could go to the wrong demographic. You, you could do three or four wrong things. But if you still was a good guy and you worked hard and you hustled, you're, you're fine. Now I feel like when you're coming out, you know, like Phoenix, when I got here, there was no dental schools. Not only no dental school in Arizona, there was none in Nevada or Utah. Now there's two in each of those schools. Phoenix didn't have water fluoridation. Now it does. Um, I feel like when you come out of school, $400,000 in student loans with water fluoridation with two dental schools, um, and, and we're at the, uh, we're at once again finding ourselves at the highest market top um, um, for a long time, that a lot of these kids, when they come out of school, they don't, they don't have the fudge room to make a couple of big mistakes. It's kind of like under these circumstances, you kind of need to come out with a parachute kind of a smooth landing and take off running what do you think are the top mistakes these young kids make when they come out of school that will still haunt them 10 20 years later oh that's a that's a good question you're talking are you speaking from the perspective of a practice just a young kid just a young kid they come out of dental school she's 25 she's 400,000 I know some really great gals that came out of UMKC in 87 and a lot of them made a bunch of crazy little mistakes, but it was a different day and time back then. And they all made spectacular careers. I just maybe do you even agree or disagree that when you come out today in 2021, it's more of a, your, your, your margins of error for success are more focused and tighter than they were in the eighties. You know, you mentioned we came out in the golden years. We were told when I was in school that our predecessors had the golden years. So I think it seems like each generation thinks they had the golden years. Uh, But every single one of us, each grouping, I think, had its own challenges. But in answer to your question, 
uh, I, I don't know if it has anything to do with purchasing a practice, but it's more of the personal choices they have in life. You know, sometimes they, they, you know, they come out and they sort of feel I spent all these years in school. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend on myself. So they get themselves in debt and, and then eventually that becomes the issue as far as their lower of, of the scores, the FICO scores, where they can't get the loan to buy a practice, which is en- going to end up paying off all those loans that they have. So I, I guess the advice is, have your priorities straight first. Uh, before you start go, going spending money on things, go ahead and first establish your practice, whether it's buying a practice or working someplace, and then the other things will follow. You know, one of the other pieces of advice I, I give to the students when I speak with them, and it, it may sound kind of odd, but I say when the first day you start practicing is the day that you start planning for your retirement. Because somebody told me that once. I, I said, it doesn't mean that you're going to say it in 27 and a half years on this day, at this hour, I'm going to retire. No, it's more like, how do you get your, your finances in place? Make sure you start, you know, you're putting away enough money in your retirement fund. Make sure you start establishing some outside interests besides dentistry, some hobbies, so that when you are ready to retire, you want to retire, you will have something to do. Because I, I don't know if you've come across this, Howard, but uh, one of the most common answers that we're, I was given when I was consulting with potential sellers, you say, you know, I, I want to retire, but I don't know what, I, what else I would do. I don't know what to do because dentistry is my life. So, it, so that's the advice I would give them. Start planning ahead. Don't just live for today. Don't live paycheck to paycheck right now. Uh, get your outside interest. Start putting money away and, and spend wisely. And then there's going to come the day when you can enjoy the fruits of your labor. My God, every dentist has a different method for valuing a practice. Some say it's a year's gross. Some say it's a year's net. Some say go there. I mean, how would you tell a dentist is listening to you right now and he owns his practice and he's an old guy and he's thinking about selling. How would you tell that guy from a thousand miles away how to, how to put a number on that practice? If they're doing it for, by the, for themselves, you mean? No, he, 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 he's trying to get a, an idea of what his I practice see. is really worth. Okay. And, and, and he's delusional and until you get something in paper, you know, I, I mean, yeah. uh, and by the way, what is the value of a, of a, of a house? Uh, what is the value of anything? Well, first of all, it's only the only value is what someone's willing to pay for it. When you, when you go get an appraisal on your house, they don't count all the bricks in your house and say each brick is worth a dollar 25. If, if, if you think your house is worth a million and no one will offer you more than $500,000 for it, how much is your house worth? Zero at that point. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, but you, 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 you just actually gave the answer that I was going to give. Uh, first, you start with that concept that the value of a practice is what the seller is willing to sell it for, and what a buyer is willing to pay for it. And if they end up meeting in the middle, or wherever it is, it's going to be sold. But that doesn't help the situation. Somebody has to come up with the number, right? So it can be anywhere from 50 to 85% of the, the most recent year's collections. And that's even a variable. You know, I, I valued practices at 45%. I valued practices at 90%, you know, like the, the Manhattan area uh, where it was very desirable. But it always comes down to, it's not necessarily the gross, it comes down to the net profit of the practice. What's the cash flow? And, you know, we have a very sophisticated computer program where we, we put in all kinds of information and then we start playing with the, let's say the sale price. We say, okay, if we value it at X, is it, is it a proper return uh, to the seller because of all the years they put in, but at the same time, is it a proper return on investment for the buyer? And we keep playing with those numbers until we find that sweet spot and say, this is the number. We also have the guideline from, from the banks. You know, uh, they, they say there's got to be a certain amount of pre-tax cash flow for the buyer after they paid the expenses of the practice and 
they they paid the uh, the debt service. If they don't have that, then then they can't really look at this practice as being the full time practice that's going to provide their income for them. So there is no rule of thumb. You know, you could have a, a there was one time I valued a, a four million dollar practice. So you think that's going to be a high number? When I did all the numbers and the pre tax cash flow, the practice had an eighty percent overhead. The practice really didn't have much value, you know. So there is no rule of thumb, and it, and it takes a lot of years of experience to do that. Look, I tried to sell my own practice, <laughs> you know, like because us dentists think we can do everything, right? We're attorneys, we're accountants, we, we can we can determine. I don't need to pay any other company to do this for me, and thank God it didn't happen. Uh, I even drew up my own contracts. I drew my, and I'm very embarrassed to admit this, but I wrote up my three page contract with the associate that this is how it's going to work. And thank God that night she called back and she said, I changed my mind. I had undervalued my practice. You know, just like we don't ask our patients to diagnose themselves, you know, we do all the diagnosis and looking. My suggestion is that you got to have, we have to, accede to to experts to to value the practices but if you want a general number there it is 50 to 85 percent and that's what it is okay here's another here's a great idea i'm not gonna i don't want to work for you i want to be my own boss but i don't want to buy a practice i'm just gonna rent an operatory in somebody's i'm gonna space share the ultimate Free dental office. What do, what do you think of this idea? That's the ultimate uh, way of killing any value in your practice. <laughs> what, 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 why, okay. Why, what do you mean? Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, in, in the metropolitan, in the big cities, that's a very common thing to do because rents are very expensive, right? So they start sharing space. When it comes, when, when you're sharing space, you and I know that we're sharing space and we have separate practices, but your name is on the door and my name is on the door. So the first things patient, uh, patients assume is that now you are, we are partners. They just assume that. This, the second thing is I am liable for any misdeeds that you commit. You could have malpractice and attorneys and patients are going to say, these are partners. They're going to come after me as well. When you're selling a practice, actually, when we come across an office share situation, we, we tell the seller, unless both of you are selling at the same time, your practice has no value. Because patients, again, go, I'm going back to the thing that they think we're partners. So patients have seen me and you. Your patients have seen me in the office. So when, when you sell a practice, they're going to say, I'm not going to go to that young person that's kind of what you know that doesn't know what they're doing yet they're kind of novices i'm going to go to this guy who i've seen around and they were partners so they must have trusted each other so the buyer ends up really not getting any very few patients if any at all okay so our suggestion is in those cases at least become partners with someone and make it an official entity then your practice has value because you can sell your shares at that point, but don't share office space because you've killed everything as far as value. Ah, man, I love, uh, you can tell you've been doing this for a mighty, mighty, mighty long time. Um, last but not least, I'll say to this, um, cause we went way over an hour. <clears throat> couple, couple of things. When, when a doctor puts up his practice, Actually, I, I can't ask the last question. I, I still got three more to go. Are you good with three more questions? Yeah, I won't charge you. Don't worry. Okay. Um. <laughs> well, you know, I always said I never had original idea in my life. I mean, I became a dentist. Guess who was a dentist? My next door neighbor. I only went one house down to become a dentist. I mean, I don't even know what the guy two houses down was. Um, I started Dental Town. Yeah, so did ESPN, and I copied their message board right down to the software. I'm, I'm like doing all this. My, my. Number one stupid waste of time that I can't seem to fix is the NFL. I'm just, uh, I'm so giddy that 
we just got J.J. White from, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's a total waste of time. But on ESPN, I saw them, this message board format made in London, and, and that was that was Dentaltown. I've never had an original idea. I always steal from the top. Well, you don't have to have a room temperature IQ in Antarctica to know that. The biggest companies in the world, it's all mergers and acquisitions. They're not starting these companies from scratch. And and the first time someone told me that they were doing uh, $4 million a year in the same building, I thought, okay, well, first of all, that's not even true. And then I got humiliated by going out and finding it. And they all had the same business program. You know what they did? They drew about a five, six, seven mile circle around their office on day one. And every time some 65-year-old man decided he was done and going to sell his practice, he says, well, here's my options. I can buy that office and roll it into mine. Or he can sell it to some young, hot, 25-year-old who's ready to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week and hustle and all that kind of stuff. And some of these guys opened up, and they were in a town of like 10 dentists. Every five years, they sucked in another selling dentist. Now they're my age, and that town of 10 dentists is down to like four locations, and six of the dentists work in him. And I I was talking to one yesterday, and I don't even want to say his name because if it got back to chip casting in Bakersfield, California, he might get really, really mad at me. I mean, these guys are north of $10 million a year in one building. Why does every dentist watch... Kramer, I know why they watch Kramer, because he's bald. I get that. I, I see the attraction. But why do they watch all the Wall Street M&A activity and then just watch that old man across the street slowing down, selling his office? Next thing you know, there's some 25-year-old person on a unicycle that bought it, kicking their butt. Why do they not do mergers and acquisitions like all of Wall Street does? Man, thank you for bringing this up. Because mergers are the best kept secret amongst dentists. I did one merger in my career and I kept looking for more. I could not find more. I, I think the short answer to that is we're cheap. We, we don't want to pay for something. The most common, uh, when, when we approached, uh, you know, when I used to approach some potential offices, say, look, I got a practice that, you know, we want to merge because, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's for various reasons. It was a merger opportunity. The first thing they would say to me, I just want to buy the charts. Well, the charts are the production, aren't they? So I, uh, I just want to pay for the patients as they come. But the ones that had the foresight would buy the practice and, and, and bring it in into their practice. And I, I don't have to tell you, there's other things that happen as to why it's a great investment. You know, your rent does not double. Your utilities don't double. Uh, maybe your, yes, your salaries are going to go up because we always recommend bring, bring the staff with you because they're the ones who actually transition to patients, by the way. So, so many things happen where all of a sudden, if a, if a practice was, you know, the bottom line was a hundred thousand, all of a sudden that becomes like 175,000. So it's a great, great business model, but we don't seem like to have the foresight and say, you know, it's okay. I'll pay that amount. And those patients are going to come to me anyway. It was the other reason given to me that, you know, if that person is going to sell the practice, pay, no, well, maybe some will come to you. Wouldn't you want to have a hundred percent of those patients? You know, we spend so much money on marketing and, and practices and you, you know, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you know what the return rate on, on marketing is, right? Usually 1% to 5%. If you get 5%, you're doing well. Well, when you buy a merger, it's a, 95%, if not more, acquisition. So you haven't wasted your money. And, and those, those patients you're going to keep producing on. So I, I, I wish to tell the young practitioners that are going on, when you buy a practice, start looking Start looking for merger opportunities. Get in touch with the companies around you. Get in touch with Paragon and say, look, if you come up with a merger, let me know. Uh, because it's great investment. Those who buy mergers looking are looking for more, uh, constantly trying to do more. And you're, and, and when you, what is the website that they go to? I mean, it's right on your wall right there. Paragon.us.com. Paragon yeah. .us.com. 
Mm-hmm. And um, that's how they, they contact you. Here, here's the last thing, and this is why I love dentists. I love them. Um, a lot of them are afraid, okay, this is my practice. I practice here in Parsons, Kansas from 25 to 65, and I'm going to sell my um, office, and I'm going to have um, Barrage do the transition, and I trust Barrage because he works for a bold guy out of Mississippi. I mean, you can't go wrong with a bold man in Mississippi. But you know what I'm really worried about the most? I'm worried about you're going to sell it to some guy and I don't want him touching my patients. I mean, who is going to buy my practice? And I, I get it. I mean, I some people will sell their dental office to the highest bidder. I want to know who the hell is going to be the dentist. So what would you say to that guy? It's, it's, it's kind of like my baby. If you decide you're going to give your baby up for adoption, well, you're not going to let Jody Arias and Ted Bundy adopt it. Um, you know, you would. I hope you would... Uh, um, they realize they're not going to be killer parents. <laughs> I got Kyle on that one. Uh, <laughs> but the bottom, the bottom line is, um, who's going to buy my practice? And what if I wouldn't let him touch me? We, again, you're hitting on so many of the points that we constantly asked, you know, when, when, when we're, uh, consulting. And the reality is that all of us want, to pass on our patients to capable hands. I'm going to give you uh, my story. So Paragon did sell my practice. So there were a couple of uh, people that they wanted to introduce to me, uh, potential buyers. So before the buyer came to have a meeting with me, I requested of the buyer that she bring with her, because she she said she does endo. I, I would like you to bring with you uh, some examples of pre-op and post-op of the x-rays of the endo. I also would like you to bring with you some uh, master models of crown preps that you've done. You know what happened? She got insulted and she told my consultant that there's no way I'm going to go meet with this, with this doctor. And that, you know, I woke up to something in there. When I purchased my practice, I had my own way of doing things. You know, I, I guess we were a little bit more up to date on things in back in 79. So all these new graduates, they think differently as well. But here's what you look for. When you have the meeting, you look, do they have a moral compass? That's what you look for. That you can discuss some dental philosophies. For example, the person who purchased my practice, we sat down and it seemed like we did things in a similar way. Not necessarily the preparation, simple thing like using a rubber dam. You know, I use rubber dam on everything. So you, you start getting to know the individual to say, okay, at least I know you're an ethical person, at least, you know, from our conversations, and I got to trust it in your hands. If we expect everyone to do things exactly the same way we did in our practice, you're never going to sell your practice. You might as well stay on and, and just uh, l- let them transition you out on a horizontal position on a gurney. Well put, because it is, um, it, it's an emotional thing um, selling your practice. You, um, you know, you're, um, it's tough in dentistry because they, you, you sell the, and in, in, you sell the invisible. I mean, when I tell you, you have four cavities, you let me do four fillings because you believe me. So if you sell it to Ted Bundy and he comes in there and says, nah, no, nah, you got 12 cavities and, and, and they're still trusting. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, vulnerable situation when you go to doctor. So I like, when I turned 50, um, they said, you know, the smart medicine is when at 50, you get an MRI of your brain every year, you know, every 10 years, 50, 60, 70, 80. And then they start with a colonoscopy where some man goes where no man's ever gone before. And, and uh, he says, uh, he videotapes it. And he, he asked me if I wanted to see the videotape. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, when I do a root canal on you, do you want to see the inside of the, the pots? I mean, um, it's trust. I told him, well, you know, you're the you're the gastroenterologist, proctologist. That I'm not that. I mean, it's like when I take my car to Lexus, the guy um did something with my brake pads or something, and he wanted to know. Um, he brought it to me in a box and wanted to see if I wanted to see it and go over with him. I'm like, no, because mm-hmm. uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I I have to trust 
that you're at the Lexus dealership, you're in a uniform, it looks like I could eat off the floor, I trust your brand. And my gastroenterologist, what I do with all physicians, all my specialties is I, I call the oral surgeons uh, that have hospital privileges and I ask for referrals from all of my oral surgeons and they give me doctors' names and... Um, um, you know, when you're selling the invisible and trust is everything, it's it's all about integrity. And so you were given this trust and integrity by the sacred sovereign profession of dentistry that's two centuries old. You graduates didn't earn that. You didn't build it. You don't even deserve it. You 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 are part of this profession, and your mission is to leave it better than you found it. And it's um and every time someone violates that oath of trust, every time someone's, you know, creative treatment planning or whatever, there's a guy in the news today. The attorney general uh, in Massachusetts cracked down on an orthodontist with several locations. Did you read about that in the paper today? Not yet. No, not yet. Yeah, and um, you know, the attorney general. Um, he had, he had pretty harsh words for this orthodontist. He said, and I quote, Massachusetts orthodontist sued by attorney general, attorney general Healy over claims. He kept children in braces for longer than medically needed. Use young patients as pawns by keeping them in braces for longer than medically necessary and filing millions in false claims to the state Medicaid program. Um, he filed the lawsuit against, Dr. Blah, blah, blah in Suffolk Superior Court on Monday. Um, blah, 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 blah. And, and I know this. This is what I know about all tribes. A lot of people blame it on dentists. It's not. It's totally natural that wherever you were born, in whatever country, whatever time, you're always going to think they have the best food, the best music, the best religion, the best everything. Because almost everything that you believe is mostly determined by exactly when and where you are born on this little rock you're trapped on that no one's got off. That being said, the dentists eat their young for breakfast because that's their tribe. So I know how this is going to play out. The orthodontist will be the hardest on this orthodontist in the world. They'll be 10 times harder on this orthodontist. I mean, they'll be, they'll be plumbers in Australia saying, Dude, lighten up. You know, you're going, but that's what tribes do. They always are hardest on their young because that's what they know. That's in their space. That's their profession. And it'll take about one day on Dental Town for the orthodontists either say, that guy needs to be strung up a flagpole and beat to death, or no, this attorney general is completely out of line. And I am. Um, I, 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 um, every, every tribe is like that. It's a thing that tribes, I've never gone to a country where the dentist there didn't think they had the best country, the best food, the best music, the best everything, the best uh, everything. So, um, um, that's why your own tribe is hard on you. I saw it with my sisters too. My si my five sisters, their friend could do something crazy and still be their best friend. But if my own sister did one half of that, the other four sisters would just be mortified. And, and I, I was always saying, okay, 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 time out. I know that was a little wild, but I'm pretty sure your best friend Jordan was the one doing donuts in the parking lot after drinking, you know, beer after work. So, you know, just, um, uh, but that's what tribes do. They all eat their young. And um, this orthodontist, you know, they're, they're not going to blame a nine-year-old kid for accepting this treatment. They're not going to blame the mother for bringing her child to the orthodontist. The other orthodontists are the one this guy's got to worry about. Sure, sure. You know, I, 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 that, th those are excellent points, but I want to add something else to that last question you had. Uh, the other concern becomes when, you know, with the seller uh, that wants to retire, they say, are, are my patients going to be agreeable in seeing the, somebody else? And I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when I was in practice, as I got older, right, uh, I, more and more, they used to ask me, patients, you're not thinking of retiring, are you? Because we won't go to anyone else. You know, I knew that was a way of them testing me to see what, where my thought process was in retirement. Lo and behold, once I sold the practice uh, and I stayed behind and worked as an associate, you know, for the, for the, for the buyer, those same patients that said to me, point blank, we won't go to anyone else, were apologizing to me as they're making their appointments to see the buyer because his hours were more convenient for them. So 
the, the point I'm making is that patients know there's going to be a change. We're not going to be working forever, you know. So so long as I do the res- I did the responsible thing, and I, I found someone who I thought was an ethical, and turns out is very ethical and moral because my wife still works there, by the way, uh, it, in my own practice after nine years. Uh, and, and the patients that I had are still there. They always ask about me. If, if you just do the best you can to pick the right person, in your opinion, and that's your own, only responsibility. After that, it's, that, it, it's to the uh, conscience of that individual that took over your practice. And dentistry was here 200 years before we were born with uh, um, Pierre Fouchard, and it'll be here two millenniums after we're gone. And, I hope uh, so. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank you, seriously, for all that you've done for dentistry, teaching, consulting, practicing. You've had a, just an unbelievable career. It's been fun watching you. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for the opportunity, Howard. And keep up the good work. You're doing a lot, too. All right. Have a great day.